It's been between two and three minutes. You know what that means. It must be time for more Follow the Money with Mitch Moss and Paulie Howard on Sirius XM 204. We're back, baby. Follow the money. More NHL first period overs to go over later in the show. We got two Ma games tonight in the NBA, too. And the second round home favorite stink bomb. Coming up as well in the NFL. Busy show coming up. Plenty of guests, but uh, very excited to welcome back the legend Bob Dancer, video poker expert. Classes start today at the South Point. Thanks to Michael Gahn for having him to do this. And it's, uh, you know, what? talk a little bit about the classes, sir, and also what we the players can expect. What will they learn and what, 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 they, what they will get out of the classes and what they won't get out of the classes, please. Thank you, Paul and Mitch. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. The classes are 10 weeks long, twice a year. So... They have 10 different games that we teach each. You can go to bobdancer.com for the schedule. You can pick up a schedule at the club booth. It starts at noon. Usually from noon to 2 is the beginner level class. From 2 to 4 is or 2 to 3.30 is an intermediate class. Intermediate class is the same game. It is more complicated. It is more powerful. So the things you will learn, number one, how to recognize a good game at a glance. Like today is Jacks Are Better. After class, you will be able to go to any Jacks Are Better class in the country and tell within 10 seconds if this is a good machine or a bad machine. Now by good, mm. machi- now by good machine, I mean if you play it for a thousand hours, are your results likely to be good? Are you gonna win today? I do not have a clue. Um, I don't know what the next half hour is gonna bring. But over the next 500 hours or next 1,000 hours, if I'm playing on a machine, I have a pretty good estimate of what my score is going to be. Second thing you're going to learn is a strategy. There's a recreational strategy in the first class, a intermediate strategy in the second class. So that is when you find this machine, um, you'll be able to do well on it. Um, the third thing, we're, we'll talk a lot about promotions. Uh, The promotion this month at the South Point, for example, is particularly good. It is for Monday through Thursday. Uh, For now, it's 15 more days, including today. You play $2,000 coin in, and you spin a wheel on the machine, and you get cash of free play. And it averages about $12. Sometimes it's $5, sometimes it's $25, but it averages about $12. Which that, and you can do it up to four times a day. So basically, there are many games here where it's 50 50. You have, it's basically an even game 24 7, and now they give you an extra $50 for showing up and playing $8,000. Now, there will be times that you, uh, for, you play 2000 and you've lost $150 and you win $5 on the spin, and you go on that. Bob Dancer, he doesn't know his butt from a burrito. That's going to happen. And there's also going to be times where you win, you know, several hundred dollars and you you do well as been. But on average, it's 0.6% redemption. So with the 0.3 club, if you're playing a 99.1 game, uh, it's even money. There are several games that we're going to teach this semester that are 99.7 to start with or higher. And so you have a significant advantage. Great answer. Dynamite. I hear your podcast has been on fire. Uh, this, this, I got up several tweets about Spanky, sports better. Sp- yeah, Spanky's good. Um, and he's going to be back on. Uh, he, he, interestingly, he never watches the game. He, could, he mm. says he could not name five NFL players. I mean, this is all the numbers for him. Is. Uh, the three most important things in his life are um, getting a good number, uh, a good shit, or sex in that order. So that's that's <laughs> okay. That's his priorities in life. Uh, Bob, you wouldn't believe how many guys I've met out here in Las Vegas over the last twenty years. Sports betters, pros, mm-hmm. they are the same exact way. They know they know no players. They just mm-hmm. follow numbers. That's it. Yep, they're all about the number. So he's going to be back on. And uh, so th- any of you who want to listen to the podcast, there's a place, there's a forum afterwards where you can enter things. If you want to ask him questions for the next time he's on, put yep. him, list them. 
And uh, it's great. I love when you do that with Narcissian too. I mean, that is fantastic. It's a fantastic listen. Yeah, yeah. Well, Spanky is a lot milder than Narcissian. Bob Narcissian bounces off the ceiling quite a bit. Sure, sure. You want to? I'll bet. I'll bet. You want? Let's make a wager here and follow the money. Okay. Alabama, Clemson versus the field next year. Charlie M makes it two twenty. Mitch threw out three dollars. Let's go two forty. Okay. I'll lay two forty. That Alabama. I get Alabama, Clemson. You can have the field. So you're putting up twenty four hundred. Yeah. And I, and I'm putting up a thousand. You want to do it? Deal. Okay. That's five hands for you. You wipe your ass with that. Shake. Oh, uh, my word's my bond. Oh, but, uh, for you. but we're saying on the air. Good? Great. Yeah, we're good. like that? All right. He's old school, Paul. You can yeah. trust this guy. Absolutely. Now, are you guys sharing this or is it? No. You want a piece? You want more? I'll yeah. think I'll You, think you guys it. work it out. My, my, my bet stays the same, but sure. any. I don't want to completely overreact from last night. Yeah. I'm, um, as, as I told him during the break, is. As Mitch mentions, people tend to overreact off of very recent data. Sure. It's a bad number, but I want to I get to make a wager with you and I can I have a story now. If you like, you could yeah. you could have the same story for two hundred and forty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not fun. It's much fun. All right. This is I haven't heard this before. Yes. The FBI called you. Yes. Can you share that story? Yes. The October first year and a quarter ago was the massacre on top of the MGM, top of the Ma- Mandalay Bay, into the country western um, concert. It was awful. And the guy who did it is said to be a high roller video poker player. So they don't didn't know why he did it. As far as I know, they still don't know why he did it for sure. And they haven't announced everything they have. So the FBI is going around asking everybody, what can you tell us? So they asked several people, if, if there was one person you've heard of who might know something about this video poker player, who would it be? And since I'm relatively famous as a video poker player, my name came up over and over and over and over oh, again. Oh, man, wow. Mm. So it happened on a... Um, Sunday night. Mm -hmm. So I got the call from the FBI the following Friday. Okay. As I was on a cruise ship that was leaving Boston Harbor to go up to uh, New England and Canada. And so the FBI wants to talk to me. Okay. And so I told him the truth. I'd never heard of the guy. Didn't even know his name until the news reports that week. And I also said, if, if it cuts out, it's because the ship's moving. And sooner or later, I'm going to get no reception, but the ship will be in Bar Harbor tomorrow morning, and you can get the schedule from ncl.com. And if you want to call me again, do it. So we, they asked several questions. Do I have any idea why, it would, um, why a video poker player would lead to being so crazy? And the answer generally is no. You have to have something, a screw loose to do something like that. But I do know that losing streaks bring out the worst in you. If you have a tendency to lie, when you're on a losing streak, you're going to lie more. If you have a tendency to overeat or overdrink or cheat in somehow, losing streaks will bring that out. Whether I don't know anything that would cause that kind of reaction, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was on a losing streak. Uh, but clearly he planned it out. So finally, they asked me what, at the time, I didn't like the question that I later figured out was a, a test to see whether or not I was telling the truth. Mm. They uh, said, all right, just for our records, you know, is your first name Robert? Because Bob Dancer, he, so they were taking my name and address and I was going, I don't really want to answer that. I didn't say it. I don't want to answer that question. Bob Dancer is a totally made up name for writing and teaching. And uh, so it's not the name on my driver's license. And I'm, but a whole lot of, whenever I'm calling a drawing or something, they call my real name. So there are thousands of players and casino employees out there who know me by my real name. And so I'm guessing the FBI had the real name. So I answered No, it's a pseudonym. This is my real name. This is my address and stuff. And he says, okay, there's no further questions. And there hasn't been any 
since then. But so I'm figuring he probably had that answer before he asked the question. Yeah. But I don't know that for sure. But they figured if I'm going to answer that correctly, I'll probably answer the rest correctly. I have one question. You get whatever you want, right? Because you're, you're, you're ridiculous high play. For the, I mean, you've ever been. Here's where I'm going with this. You can answer that. And okay. He, he specifically asked for those two rooms overlooking the concert. He had the same clothes on. He had 21 suitcases. He refused to leave the suitcases, and he used the back elevator and wouldn't leave the, the suitcases with the, with the bellman. Okay. Now, you see, you all have all this information after the fact. Um, there are rules that have changed as to whether or not you can keep your door locked for you know, three days in a row without anybody going in. And the rules were made based on this. We have a tendency to f make rules to fight yesterday's wars, like, um, like airport mm -hmm. security and stuff. And so, uh, but yeah, you can get a lot of special requests if you lose enough. Now, the value of your customer, part of it depends on how big of a player you are, but also whether or not you lose. Everything I heard of by Steve Wynn and others were he's a considerable loser at the game. Hmm. Okay. I, I, all right. I, I could say Monday morning quarterback. I just found I, – well, that, uh, I just wanted to ask you that. Good, good answer, though. Gambling Witch and Ed, Edge podcast. Check it out with uh, Richard Munchkin. The classes start today at the South Point. Great promotions, and it's a terrific – I mean, it's a top-notch operation, what Bob runs here. So that starts – today with the classes as well. Finally, we will get to it up next, the Jeopardy story coming up with Bob Dancer on Follow the Money. And we're back with more Follow the Money on Sirius XM 204. Mitch Moss and Paulie Howard have the mics for the information you need to win. 15 minutes away from second round stink bombs, divisional round with the home teams. The list is staggering. Who's going down this year? As uh, the home team coming up, we continue with Bob Dancer. Follow the money, bobdancer.com. And the classes start today at the South Point. Here it is. Take it away. I'm excited. We always say we're going to get to what we don't. Share the Jeopardy story. And your tease, your tease last week was you were supposed to work out a deal with the guy when you're on the show, and, and, and the guy reneged. Yeah, well, that, let's get to that later if we have time because the story itself takes a while. I had wanted to be on Jeopardy forever. I had practiced. I had read all the books, uh, memorized trivia books, history books. I knew all the academy, just worked and worked and worked. I still had to take the test twice. So they give the test every year. And, but the second time I passed, partly because they kept the same question from year to year, mm. which was convenient. <laughs> and I didn't know that. But um, so I started telling 400 of my closest friends that I was on Jeopardy and that they watched on uh, Friday night the 3rd at 7 o'clock, they would see me, which was an accomplishment because I only had 20 friends. <laughs> and there was no, no Facebook, no Twitter, no computers. So everything was word of mouth and telephone and letters and stuff. But I was, I was a one-trick pony. Everybody, when they met me within the first 10 seconds, oh, did you know that I was on Jeopardy? And let me tell you about what Alex Trebek is really like and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so I was just unbearably obnoxious and probably would have been riding that pony still had it not been for a guy named Paul Rodriguez. Now, I know he shares the first name with you, Paul, but um, please forgive him for that. The... Uh, <laughs> At the time, I was a database administrator at a Fortune 500 company in Los Angeles area, and Paul worked in the same department as a computer programmer. So we were buddies outside where we would both go to country western dances at night. We were both single at the time, and basically I wanted to be Paul. I was t much taller. He was like 5'6", but muscular and slender and... Uh, the girls loved him. He was from, uh, his parents were from Puerto Rico. He was really proud of his heritage, and he had a great sense of humor about it. He would go up to this beautiful blonde and said, you know, how lovely she was, and said, oh, by the way, um, do you have a little Puerto Rican in you? And she would always say no. And he said, 
would you like a little Puerto Rican in you? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, old joke, but it worked and he yeah. got slapped and it was like, it was great. <laughs> so then I got on Jeopardy and I started telling people that. So now instead of all the girls wanting to talk to Paul, they came over to listen to my stories about Jeopardy. Now this really upset Paul's idea of what the balance of power should be. He got really, really irritated. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. And he said, it can't be that big of a deal to get on Jeopardy. I bet I could get on Jeopardy. And so this is kind of music to my ears. I have always been a gambling man. So I said, you know, would you uh, like to make a little wager? And uh, so we hemmed and hawed back and forth. We ended up uh, $250 bet which was big enough for him, and, uh, and that was fine. Pussy. And, well, I, I couldn't lose because, I mean, Paul was smart, but like street smart. In college, he basically majored in getting laid. There was no way that he was going to pass a Jeopardy test. So I was even so confident that I was giving him some hints, like, you know, they, I s casually mentioned that they gave the same test, you know, from last year mm. and so I lent him all these books like I said you memorize this almanac that'd be a good idea you know <laughs> and of course you know who can memorize an almanac so uh so all that was fine and then finally he went to take the test he said he was um they give the test two times morning and afternoon so he was going to take the whole day off of work he was only going to take the test in the afternoon but he figured he would stay home and study in the morning so his, now there's truly 100,000 different questions they can ask you in Jeopardy. And the idea that he was going to get the magic question in the morning by a little bit extra study is unlikely. So I told him this. I said, I think that's a really smart idea, Paul. So, uh, so Paul went. So that night we got home. I went dancing and he wasn't there. And I was figuring he was going to come with my $250. The next day at work, I said, I want my $250. And he said, well, not so fast. He said, I'm still alive. He goes, now they do accept more people than they, uh, than they actually get on. But, but he said, I was definitely made the finals. And if you want to settle now for two, paying me $245, I'll accept. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there's no way in hell I'm paying him $245. I said, although if you want to pay me $245, I'll consider it. Probably not considered very hard. He said, okay, still, the bet's still alive. So uh, now he stopped going dancing and he stayed home and studied. Could not figure this out. Finally, he, um, he said, next Tuesday, they're taping the show. Do you want to be in the audience? And I'm going... Yeah, I want to see this with my own eyes. So I, I have my $250 just in case. I can't, still can't believe he did it. But I get over there, and he's in the group of contestants. So I figured, okay, I've lost. So he was still my buddy. I rooted for him. He didn't win. But after he signed up, after he signed all the papers, shook Dallas Trebek's hand, we went out for a drink. And I said, all right, you got to tell me how you did it. He says, can't do that. Mm. You have to pay me another $250 if you want me to tell you how I did it. So I called him some names <laughs> and I said, I've already paid you $250. He says, thank you very much. But uh, if you want me to tell you, you pay me now, because if you wait till tomorrow, the price is going to go up to 500 and who knows what it is is going to be after that. And couldn't couldn't wait. So I said, all right. I said, I don't have the money on me, but I'll give it to you tomorrow. How'd you do it? He said, well, it was easy. I took the test twice. I said, how did you take the test twice? They only give it once a year. He goes, yeah, they give it once a year, but they give it twice in the same day. So in the morning I wore a Los Angeles Dodger, uh, Fernando Valenzuela, uh, shirt and people can't tell the difference between Puerto Ricans and Mexicans anyway. And so, and I wore my glasses and I, I couldn't have passed the test, but I memorized all of the questions. And then for the three hours between things, I went to the library, looked everything up, came back in my suit and tie, had my contacts on. He goes, you know, he told me that I'd recognize him both ways, which I would, because I've seen him a lot, but nobody else would recognize him as the same guy. 
And so um, anyway, I called him some more names. He, he said, I'm always talking about gambling with an edge. Aren't I, isn't he proud of me for, uh, aren't, he'd want to know if I was proud of him mm -hmm. for uh, gambling that way. And uh, anyway, I had some more names for him. Uh, I said, well, what if they change the test? He goes, well, I would have lost 250. He said, but I already figured that I was going to get you for 500 if I, Pass, so I figured the odds were two to one in my favor. So, anyway, uh, he moved away six months later. I haven't seen him since. Oh. But uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Jesus, my God, fantastic! What was your story where the guy reneged on the? Well, we, 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 well, we was, I don't have time. Go. We have thirty seconds. Can you fit it in? Yeah. The. On Final Jeopardy, we had a deal beforehand. We said in the hallway that if either one, if we're in first and second place, and if the guy in second place bet the farm, the guy in first place would bet the right amount so that they would tie, and you both get the money, come back the next day. He, um, I was in second place, bet the farm. We both got it right, but he bet, so he ended up $100 ahead of me. Uh, he decided he, so I didn't. I got a Lazy Boy recliner and Lee Press on nails or whatever it was, but uh, didn't get the money. Thanks for coming in. Th Classes start today. BobDancer.com, Gambling Edge Podcast. Division Around Stink Bombs next.